In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you because thus far you have led us. And we come before you now to consider this important subject. We thank you because you have challenged us already that you should sanctify your people, Lord. And Lord, it's a united prayer that as many as have not been sanctified, you will sanctify them this very day in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that our hearts will receive your word. And that as we receive, the blessing of that word will come upon every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray you make every one of us ready so that we will receive at your hand. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Isaiah chapter 29, we have these important words in verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 29, verses 11 and 12. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to him or to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. In those two verses we have a problem highlighted, and it is a problem that we have in many congregations today and among many people that try and endeavor to worship the Lord and find out the might and the will of the Lord. It says the vision of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the revelation that is coming from God to the heart of man, what heaven considers to be very essential, very important. And it sends to the community, the congregation of people. He gives that book, that vision, to a person that is learned. But then he says, I cannot read it because the book in which that vision, that revelation is contained, is sealed off. And although I can read it, if somebody opens the book for me, the book is sealed. And because it is sealed, I cannot understand. On the other hand, then, you go to another individual that is not learned. If the learned people have failed, if the educated people have failed, if those who have studied cannot interpret the book on us, then we give to the one that is not learned. And we say, read this. Oh, he says, I have an handicap. My problem is that I am not learned. I cannot read. Then the agony in the hearts of the people that are waiting for the revelation of God is we give it to those who can read is they say it is sealed we give to those who are not learned and then those people say they cannot read how are we going to have the mind of God and this is a problem you find in many circles today you find among educated people they try to read the word of God and they try to find out the implications and the interpretation of the word of God for them. Unfortunately, because they depend upon their intellect. And they do not have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Although they are learned, the book is sealed for them. Then, on the other hand, you go to the illiterates, the people that cannot read. And although they may try to worship, and in their worship they may try to say they have the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus Christ said, when the Holy Spirit is come, it will bring to your remembrance the things that you have read. Although these illiterate people claim the Holy Spirit, they cannot read. And because they cannot read, they are also handicapped. And so the Holy Ghost is not able to bring to their remembrance what they have not read. Because nothing has been deposited there, nothing comes out also eventually. 
And this is a problem you want to avoid. You do not want to see it on the ivory tower of learning and say, we know it all, we can read. Without the Holy Ghost, the book is sealed unto you. On the other hand, you do not want to put a premium on illiteracy. You do not want to give any credit to illiteracy. Because if there is illiteracy, you cannot read that book, then the Holy Ghost will not be able to bring to your remembrance what you have not read. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 and verse 26. And at that, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Here we find at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ came, there were people that had grown up as doctors of the Lord. And some of the people were referred to as the scribes. Some of these doctors of the law and scribes were Pharisees. Others were Sadducees. And others were the Zealots. And these people, when Jesus Christ came, they tried to check Jesus out. You remember when Jesus Christ was born, Herod demanded of these people where Christ should be born. And he went to the Old Testament and he told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. And when Jesus began to grow up at the age of 12, he was in the synagogue in their temple. And he checked them out. He was asking them questions that no boy of the age of 12 had ever asked them. And he answered questions from them that no boy of the age of 12 had ever answered. If those people had known the time of the peace of Jerusalem, they would have known that this is he the anointed of the Father, the Christ, and the Messiah, the one that was to come. But he didn't realize. And then at the age of 30, he appeared in Jordan. And John recognized him and said, You should have baptized me, and how can I baptize you in water? Let it be so, and leave it like that, suffer it to be so now. Because it is that that will make us fulfill all righteousness. He went into the water. As he was coming out, the Spirit of God came upon him. And the voice of the Father from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was not done in a corner. There were people that flooded to that place because the Bible says they came from Jordan, they came from Judea, and they came from all of Jerusalem. And all those people, they heard, they saw. When the Spirit of God came upon him, the voice of the Father said, This is he, your one salvation. This is he, your one righteousness. This is he, you want to know the mind of the Father. This is he, you want to be linked, reconciled with the Father. This is he, I'm well pleased in him. But unfortunately, although they saw him, they rejected him. And because they rejected him, they could not get the word that he brought to them from the Father. And at this particular time now, after Jesus Christ had emphasized all the things that needed to be emphasized, in fact, Matthew writes for us, he rise from the very beginning, and you can see that step by step, he was telling the children of Israel, Behold, this is your king, and this is the one you've been expecting for hundreds and thousands of years. They didn't receive, and so at this time Jesus said, God, I thank you. Oh, my Father, I thank you. Why? Because you have hidden all these beautiful things, the riches of the kingdom of God. You have hidden them away from the wise and the prudent. That is, those who are wise in their own sight. Those who are knowledgeable in their own sight. Those who feel, I knew that already. There is no other new thing. There is nothing new under heaven that I have not known. I have read that before. I have heard that before. I could talk about that myself. All those wise and prudent people, Jesus said, Oh, Father, you have hidden all these things away from them because they're self-sufficient and because they're self-confident. Then Jesus said, But, Father, you have revealed them unto babes. Babes, was he talking of? Toddlers, infants, 
the people that knew nothing. Oh, he was talking of Peter, James, John, Matthew, Philip, Bartholomew, and all these other adults. Even some of them married. And he called them babes. You know, it's not, he wasn't calling them babes because of the physical side of it. Because in the spiritual, they were willing to learn. They knew they didn't know and they wanted to know. They knew that this was the very Christ. And they knew that if they were going to get the riches of heaven, it was from this person they were going to get it. And therefore they had an open heart. And with that open heart, they were like babes in the Lord. And Jesus said, I thank you because you have revealed them unto babes. And then he says, even so, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Until this very day, almost 20, almost 2,000 years have passed now, but till this very day, that's still the way the Lord is operating. That is still the way that He operates. He reveals unto babes. He reveals unto the people that know that they don't know. The people that know their shortcoming. The people that know their ignorance. The people that know their depravity. The people that know their carnality. The people that know that they are not there yet, but they want to be there. And they are all the time telling the Lord, I know my limitation. I know the limitation of my experience. I don't have it yet, but I want to have it. And the people that are eager, pressing on, wanting to have, wanting to see, wanting to learn. Those are the people that the Father is revealing these to. I pray that the Lord will give you a heart that is tender. A heart that wants to receive. A heart that wants to learn. Now, and this is the reason God has blessed us in a church like this. Uh, because, you see, although I was born in a religious home, and my parents went to church, although at the very uh, early age we went to church and we read the Bible and we had Bible reading and family devotion every morning, but I knew next to nothing about the Bible. Then I went to a particular school where uh, they taught us there there was no God at all, and where they thought of, taught us that the Bible had no meaning at all, that you are the master of your faith and the captain of your own soul. That you do not need another savior. And in that confusion I was for many years. And then I began to question in my heart. I said, oh Lord, I'm ignorant. What this, uh, you know, highly educated fellow is saying, all the authorities is quoting from this and that. And all the things we dig out from encyclopedia. Are all these things right? Oh Lord, I want to know. Because I had a tender heart and I was like a babe, then the Lord began to draw me to the Bible. And I began to draw into the Bible just wanting to study the Word of God. And although I went to university and although I, I, you know, did the studies that I ought to do, I was so eager to know this Bible that 1964 when I entered, I just began to read my Bible. Although the library books were there and all the things that we needed to do, all those things were there. And at that time, you know, the course I took happened to be a difficult course. We only had 12 that could make it. I think we started with in the year one, about uh, 30, 35. By that time, though, some people had gone to the other easier branches of study. And we just had 12. And it was a very difficult course and very difficult class. And some of the lecturers too, they were difficult. Maybe they purposely did that. But even though I had all that to do, I was telling the Lord, how could I live without knowing the Bible? How could I die without knowing the Bible? I felt that the greatest thing you could learn, you could study, was just the Bible. And the people that drew, that drew me to the Lord, that made me to know the way of salvation, well, they didn't even go to secondary school. They were illiterate. I had a lot of questions to ask that they couldn't answer. Because of all the things before I became born again, all the things I'd known from encyclopedia, from all those authorities in history, ancient history, and First World War, Second World War, and all the people that determined they were going to succeed, they were going to do this or that, they have put that all in my brain, and the planning and the goal setting, and that you make up your mind in life, self-reliance, that if you're going to do anything at all, don't rely on God, don't rely on anybody, rely on yourself, and you will make it. Now, all the questions I had to ask, if I ask those questions from those pastors, they themselves will be confused. I could tell them things, I could ask them questions that they will not be able to make head or tail of. And I needed answers myself. What will I do? I went to God, I said, God, 
I want to love you, but I cannot love you in darkness. I cannot love you with all my ignorance, with all the questions I had within me. Therefore, Lord, I want to know, teach me. I became like a baby. And I started following, you know, just reading through the Bible. And just reading through and marking this and marking that. And I'll come across a passage that I did not understand. And when I did not understand, I left it there. And then while we're in class, I don't know, I even made my papers. But I made my papers and, you know, I wasn't a mediocre student either. And yet while we're in the class or anywhere, if I was going like this, I'll be thinking of that verse. What could that verse mean? Oh Lord, what's the significance of that? All these things they are talking about, holiness and sanctification. How can you be sanctified? And sometimes when class, the answer will come. I mean, answer to the Bible. And I'll take my pen and jot that thing down. I read Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know how many times. And I was, uh, you know, also practicing music and doing everything. And even about a day to the exam, I'll still read my Bible as if I was going to take exam in the Bible. My classmates will say, eh, what are you doing? You are going to fail. I said, well, if I fail, then that will be surprising because, you know, God is on my side. All you have is library book and all you have is your brain, but I have the library books you have and the brain that you have, I also have God on my side. Well, you'll be surprised that, you know, when I came in in year one, uh, because I didn't go to what we called HSC then, and I didn't do all the subjects I should have done, because I was a kind of a self-made student myself. After secondary school, I just started preparing for GCA level. And all I could do was the mathematics, the physics I couldn't do. And when I went to university, they, they accepted me for mass, mass, uh, geology. But it was at the point of registration that the fellow looked at my papers and I said, no, you won't do geology, you'll do physics. I said, is that so? He said, yes. And so he went around and changed everything. And I, did, I knew next to nothing on these physics at that level. And there was a young man in that class that took interest in me. If we were to perform any experiment, he will say, this is how they do it. This is how they plot the graph. And this is how they measure this. And this is how they test this. I will say, thank you. If we did all the experiments, then he will tell me, ah, when you have done all the experiments and found out this and you have written all those things, how do you make your conclusion? What are the theories that you know that will back up all the things you have done to be able to present this on paper? And this young man will teach me this and teach me this. And sometimes when he wants to teach me, we're in the same class, I'll say, no time now. Uh, it's time for Bible now. Ah. And he'll say, uh, what's the matter with you? I'm trying to help you. You won't be able to make it. I said, I will make it. Just uh, when I have time, I'll send for you. And after studying Bible, I had to read the previous progress. I had a timetable. Then I had to study the theory of music. I had to, you know, practice the organ. I had to do this and that. And the fellow said, you will not make this scene. You know that I left him at university because even though he was teaching me, he didn't make it. I made it. Because, you see, my heart, I just wanted to know God. You see, if you are like that, you really want to know God, I'm telling you that you will know God. But it is, you see, when we are proud... And when we feel that, no, I don't have anything to learn, I've known it all, I've learned it all, then you come into the position of the wise and the prudent, that then it will not be revealed unto you. But then it says you have revealed it unto babes, and said, Jesus said, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Well, what we're talking about this morning is purity within a must. Purity within a must. And this is where you find many people, wise and prudent, they argue a lot. Oh, they say that cannot be. They say that is not possible. But I thank God if you have a tender heart to learn, the Lord will show you his own way. And he will show you that it is possible for you to live a righteous life. And it is possible for you to have a pure heart, a pure life. And even though temptations may be around you, even though the people of the world may try to confuse you, but by the grace of God, you will have the experience of purity of heart. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. 
Now David was asking the Lord who will eventually abide in the presence of God. And here came the answer from the Lord himself. He that has clean hands, clean hands, clean hands, and a pure heart. It is not either or. It is both and. It is both this and that. It is not either this or that. It is not either having clean hands or a pure heart. It's joining both together on the one hand. You need a pure heart. On the other hand, you need clean hands as well. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Many people may question and wonder whether there is a possibility of being pure in heart, but Jesus Christ said, oh yes, there will be, because in fact only those kinds of people will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. I want to tell you that when I was uh, young like you and I started reading the Bible like this, you see when you read the Bible so much and you learn the Word of God, it cuts you away from a lot of other things. In fact, uh, the other Christians around me at that time uh, because, you see, in those uh, early days, although I was going to my regular church, I associated with the Christian people on the campus. And at the Bible study, you know, they will say, this is not possible, that is not possible. Then I will say, from what I've read, this is possible. And when they couldn't handle me in the uh, little uh, Christian community there, that is the Bible study, then they took me to the chapel, and there was this professor of religion. And this professor of religion at the university there, they called him to the particular study that night because they felt that all these other students could not handle me in our Bible study class because I'll all the time be saying, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If, they, if we drag it here and drag it here and drag it there, I will end up by saying, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They will say, well, what if a person does this and this, and after giving all the arguments and all the examples, I will end up by saying, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Then they felt it's difficult for fellow students to handle this man. Therefore, they called this uh, professor, you know, with a lot of degrees, head of department of religion and culture, and uh, he came that day and we were sharing the word of God. And of course, they made sure that they introduced uh, the people so that, so as just to sub me notice that uh, I was now in, in that uh, circle. And they said, this is Professor so-and-so. You see the life is not dead yet. Uh, it's still over there. They said, this is Professor so-and-so. And this is so-and-so. And they also, they brought other students that were studying religion. And some of them had mustache and some of them had beard. Uh, just to be a little bit wild. And then they said, this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, so I kept quiet, and we started the Bible study the way we used to do. And then they started saying, you know, once you are saved, you are saved forever. You may smoke, you may drink, you may commit adultery, you may commit fornication. God loves you so much that once you are saved, you are saved forever. In fact, nobody can live a holy life. And you see, when I, in any group that I was, I couldn't bear that kind of thing no matter what and our own bible study was much longer than all the others because you know in all the other groups and at the various halls whenever they said anything they just said yes, yes they were the yes men i was never a yes man and so immediately they said that and i just uh, spoke out i said no without holiness no man shall see the lord and uh, so prof uh, now spoke out in that heavy matured old age voice and said young man according to Zechariah's according to church history and he began to quote authors I said it's not author it's what Jesus Christ said be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect it's either those authorities know more than Jesus then they become our savior or Jesus knows more than them and then Jesus will say, Savior, that I will stay with Jesus. If perfection were not possible, if holiness were not possible, if purity of heart were not possible, Jesus Christ was the economist of words. He'll never say those words because he never used any redundant word. He never said anything that shouldn't have been said. 
and then that day the professor quoted his own and quoted his authority but i went back to my authority the word of god established from everlasting to everlasting and though professors and colleges and universities and deans and all those people may change our god remains ever the same and so i came out of the university it was like i was a lone ranger and it was like nobody will ever listen to me and it was like you know this was an impossible task that i had and so when i came to the university of uh, lagos in uh, 1972 uh, the christian union there had heard about me they didn't know i was a troubleshooter a troublemaker uh, but they thought uh, you know i was just a quiet nice man that could come and give them a you know kind of message at the christian union and uh, so they called me and they gave me a subject they shouldn't have given me they gave me the subject i'll be talking about tomorrow which is the christian and the world and when I got that uh, paper, they wrote to me from Unilag, and they said, this is what I'll be talking about. I knew that we were in for another deal. And so I went into the Word of God, and I came over there. And when I came, that was May 1972. And I delivered the message for them. It was too hard for them to know that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Because the seed of God remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. He that doeth righteousness is of God. Because Christ abides in him. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Immediately I finished like this. Somebody just left the congregation and took over the microphone and said, Everybody sit down. We have not finished yet. We do not accept that. Open confrontation. And then he started preaching his own. And you know, the people were here and there. And you know, they pulled him up there. They said, let the old man, let the man go. Uh, because nobody accepts what he has said. And so they quieted everything down. And then he and some other people came to me after that meeting and said, those things you have said, it's impossible. How can a person live without sin? And that a person should not be of the world. And I quoted the Bible to them. But no, they will not accept. And then God so worked it. It was that same year, 1972. I went to do my postgraduate at the University of Lagos. And I had made up my mind that I will not have anything to do with that kind of group because I remember 1964 to 1967, it was always argument, always, you know, dragging this and tearing this apart, and I didn't want that anymore. Uh, but then when I came in, in September 1972, here came the president of the Christian Union then, and he said that, uh, well, we still remember the experience we had in May, uh, but we hope that you will not abandon us. And I said, you know, uh, a person like me is not a person you want in your fellowship because I'm a student of the Bible and I'm a student of John Wesley and a student of Charles G. Finney and I read those Puritans and those people that emphasize holiness because the only single thing in life that matters is you have the grace of God so fill you and so saturate you that you will live like Enoch like you live like Samuel, live like Daniel, who purposed in his heart, he will not defile himself with the meat of the king, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that said, no, we will not bow down to your idol, come what may. I said, I'm like the people of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, wanting to press on, that I may be found, not in my righteousness, but in that righteousness which is of the faith of Jesus Christ, to be crucified with him, nevertheless to live, because it is not I that liveth, it is Christ that liveth, Liveth in me that I'm of those people that will reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin and alive unto righteousness. I'm not the kind of person you will want in your fellowship so that I don't disorganize everything for you. And he said, We still want you all the same. And so uh, I was on the edge like that. But again, it was a year, a year of uh, trouble. And so when I became a lecturer at the University of Lagos, 1973 August. I decided that, well, if there were only just a few people that wanted this word of God, I think it's good for us to just get together and study the Bible. And for all those years, I was able to get 15 people that said they wanted the Bible. And so we decided August 3rd, 1973, we'll come together and study the Bible. And then as we study the Bible on holiness, on evangelism, on the totality of the revelation of the word of God, these people were like babes. 
and they were willing to study the word of God and they started coming and started coming challenges have come on the way and some of the people have confronted me and they have said this will not last I had a particular man that came to me and he said he was prophesying he said everybody has spoken to me that this holiness is not possible sanctification is not possible that is not possible and therefore now he came with a prophecy and he came to my house and I you know I said uh, come in I didn't know what he was coming for and then when he uh, sat down he greeted me and then he became serious like an old testament prophet and uh, then he said that I came to you from the Lord. Oh, I said, is that so? And then he began to say that because you have not accepted to change because of this, because of that, this thing is going to break and then nobody will follow anymore and this and that. And when he said that, I said, well, do you know something? If everybody left and I was the only one remaining that was going to stand on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He looked up at me very bold and, you know, very, very firm. And he said, that you have said is the confirmation of the word of prophecy I brought. Everybody is going to leave and this a deeper life will not uh, remain because you stand alone on this holiness and everybody says we disagree and you're still continuing. What I want to tell you, that person that said that is nowhere to be found today. But you know, the word of God has remained. And as we look around... I just, uh, you know, two weeks ago I was in Ghana, in Ghana, and we had, you know, a workers retreat and people came from the Gambia, they came from uh, Liberia, where the war is, you know, terrible now. Some of the people that are even serving with Ecomog, they are attending the fellowship in Liberia. And, uh, you know, we are thousands of people there. And we have the campground in Ghana uh, that is about uh, five times or so of the whole of this campus IBTC. And then, you know, they have, uh, you know, they have their horse, they have this, they have that in Ghana there in Kumasi. The Lord started that work when I was still over here at the University of Lagos. I will go there and still emphasize the same holiness. The same thing they told me in Ghana. They said it's impossible. It's impossible. But I want to tell you that last December, in the December retreat alone, we registered more than 26,000 people. Adults without children. And just last week, I was in Ivory Coast. Uh, when we got to when I got to Ivory Coast in about 1984 and we started holiness without which no man shall see the Lord you know those uh, French people told me oh they say uh, something may work in the English speaking countries something may work in Nigeria but that one the life of French speaking people is totally different you cannot do that in Ivory Coast I said what you don't want Jesus Christ in French speaking country you don't want life of holiness in French speaking country and so we started and I want to tell you that I was there just last week I came back on Saturday and uh, we had people from Cape Verde we had people from Guinea Bissau we had people from Senegal we had people from uh, Ivory Coast all over in all their provinces and uh, you know the, the inspector of police there uh, who is uh, in their own system almost next to the uh, next to the uh, president is a member of uh, the deeper life there and uh, you know the the fellow was uh, you know driving me about from the place they put me to the uh, place of meeting uh, you know was uh, a policeman himself but a member of the church and a lot of those people there and and guess what we were doing talking about the same thing holiness without which no man shall see the lord and as when that french country just last week thousands of them thousands of them and they were rejoicing in the lord and I could tell you a lot of things that have taken place there. You know what I'm telling you? If you stay with God, God will stay with you. If you stay with the word of God, God will stay with you. And what appears very small, and the Lord is going to multiply it in Jesus' name. Now you may not know that in the late 70s when we started what we call the HIP, Higher Institution Program, what we later uh, called now DLCF, Deeper Life uh, Campus Fellowship. Uh, you may not know that when we started it was a lot of trouble. Uh, some of our students when we started this uh, Deeper Life Campus Fellowship, they were locked off on the campus. And the other people uh, who were in the other groups, they were making trouble with them. This will not stay. That will not stay. This cannot be. Because we cannot have deeper life on the campus. It will bring division. It will bring difficulty. 
and you know they read, wrote letters to me petition letters and wrote this and wrote that and everything and said cancel this thing cancel this thing and i would have cancelled it if they were ready for holiness without which no man shall see the lord if they were doing it and reaching those people who would have cancelled it but i said no if we cancel it are we going to lift up the banner of holiness if we cancel it, are we going to emphasize this sanctification purity of heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, only they shall see the Lord. So I said, we will not cancel it. Oh yes, we suffered. Oh yes, things were written against us. Oh yes, some people even made us enemies. It was like it was a personal fight. But look at it right now. Things have changed. And things are changing. And look at it as we are here. And we declare the whole, the totality, the entirety of the word of God. It pays to suffer for Christ. What I just want to tell you is that uh, those of us, I'm getting older, not getting younger. And uh, by the grace of God, although you see that my voice is still strong, yet, um, you know, little by little, I'm getting older than you are. I'm, I'm sure you understand. I'm a little bit older than you are. And uh, because of that, as we pass on, you are then to take my place. And then you are to carry this torch of holiness. And every campus where you go, and every community where you go, and maybe you know God will scatter you all through the continent of Africa. And everywhere you go, you will declare without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And when you do it like I've done it, you suffer like I've suffered, you emphasize it like I, like I emphasize, you read the Bible like I do, you study like I do, and you devote yourself like I do. I believe that God can even do much more through you than through me. Uh, because you know when, when I started I didn't have any predecessor I didn't have any example I didn't have any challenge I didn't, in fact all the people I had they were telling me slow down slow down I didn't have anybody to challenge me I didn't have anybody to encourage me even the pastors in the church I was going at that time they were saying this is too much slow down even though that church believes in holiness and yet when I brought out the real holiness material they said this is too much this is too much slow down and I said, no, I will not slow down. And I got kicked out. It's as a result of not slowing down you are here this morning. If you slow down, other people that are supposed to come, they will not be able to come. But I believe you will not slow down. You will declare the word of God. And as you declare the word of God, mighty things will be taking place through you in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We're talking about purity within, a must. That means the necessity of sanctification and holiness. There are four points I want to briefly look at. Number one, salvation and righteous living. Salvation and righteous living. Number two, sanctification and inward purity. Number two, sanctification and inward purity. Number three, supplication and holiness experience. Supplication and the holiness experience. Number four, the evidence of sanctification and inward purity. The evidence of sanctification and inward purity number one we need to understand that when we're saved immediately god helps us to begin to live a righteous life that means you are stealing you will no more continue to steal you are gambling you will no more continue to gamble you are telling lies you will not continue to tell to tell the lies you are a deceiver before and you are running after ladies or you are running after men before but you will not do that anymore a change will come into your life the moment you become born again we talked about being born again yesterday which is salvation you have the grace of god god's righteousness at christ's expense and you get that righteousness of god at salvation of the lord through faith forsaking all i trust him or like we explained yesterday, you know the fact of your redemption. You agree with that fact of redemption. You internalize that fact of redemption. You trust your soul, your eternity, your interest, everything into him. And then he gives you the hope for life eternal. 
by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God when that salvation comes a change will follow in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 therefore if any man be in Christ is a new creature all things are passed away behold all things are become new when you come into Christ when you become a child of God things change things change your life will change the direction of your life will change your conduct will change the activities of your life will change your hobby will change your interests will change your extracurricular activities the things that used to turn you on used to interest you everything will change and of course your association will change and all the things that you have been doing your relationships with people to you everything will change that is what it means when it says if any man be in christ he is a new creature in a real sense in a true way all things are passed away all things are become new and in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 34 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 34 awake to righteousness and sin not awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God I speak this to your shame Paul the apostle was speaking to the Corinthian believers and in the Corinthian church there were some people that didn't know that when the grace of God comes in that the grace of God makes us to live an overcoming life a victorious life and so he challenged them and he called them to the life of righteousness and said, Awake to righteousness. Don't sleep. Awake to righteousness. It's not time to slumber. Awake to righteousness. It's not time to forget yourself. Awake to righteousness. And sin not. And sin not. A lot of sins had crept into the Corinthian church. Fornication had crept in. Even eating things, sacrificed to idols, had crept in. Paul's doctrine concerning the resurrection had crept in. A lot of things that were not right for Christians. Carnality had also crept in. And yet Paul the Apostle now said, Come back, awake to righteousness and sin not. Then he said, eh, For some of you have not the knowledge of God. The people that do not have the knowledge of God, they are the people that still, still say they are born again and they are living in sin. They are born again, girlfriend is there. They are born again, boyfriend is there. They are born again, dancing is there. They are born again, drinking is still there. They are born again, but they are still lying. They are born again, they are still playing coupon and lottery. They are born again, but a lot of things they are still doing. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. Then he told the Corinthian church, I speak this to your shame. Then in First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 2. The elder women as mothers and sisters and the younger as sisters with all purity. You know, it is important for us to notice that as young people and even older people, we should so serve the Lord with purity of life. And your life should not be a mess. You shouldn't, uh, you know, have all these uh, various evil things that the young people are doing today. Uh, messing up their lives with immorality. If we say we are born again, let there be a clear cut experience of being born again. You know, there are challenges that we will have as students. I remember when I was a student and uh, my roommate, I got him to read in the Bible with me uh, every morning. And uh, there were times, although we couldn't continue, because um, if I knocked on sin, if I knocked on, uh, you know, some of the things that he used to do, the following morning, if I said, let us read the Bible, they said, no, I've not recovered from the one of yesterday. Uh, so we might uh, miss it for about a few about a few uh, days and then I'll you know plead with him and pet him a little bit so we'll start all over again and then I will tell him that uh, you uh, do the uh, devotion this morning just two of us and then he will open the Bible and uh, so he will read the passage and with his uh, Baptist background he will say a few things and then he will say I'm exhausted do you have anything to say and I'm never exhausted you know that 
And um, so if he said, I'm exhausted, do you have anything to say? Then I took it from there on and started talking on salvation again. But we, we always had a particular problem. It will be Saturday afternoon. And I knew that his girlfriend will come that Saturday afternoon. And uh, what the other roommates do is that uh, politely and quietly, when that uh, lady comes in, uh, we'll say, oh, how are you, uh, so and so. And then we'll, you know, do as I, I wanted to go to the library before, to the cafeteria before. I wanted to go to the uh, supermarket and buy this or that so as to give them chance to do whatever they want to do and pack all their books and everything. But, you know, I changed my timetable because I knew that that was the time that that lady will come. Uh, the things I should have done in the library and other places, I would have done it. And at the time she ought to be there, I'll be at my table in that room studying my book. And uh, when she comes in, you know, I will say, uh, welcome, so and so. Uh, and then after she, if uh, she didn't uh, meet him there, saying maybe she went to, he went to the toilet or something, and uh, we'll say, how is uh, so and so? I don't want to name him because now he's a lecturer in, you know, one of the universities. And uh, I will say, well, he's, uh, he's uh, coming. And I'll say, before he comes, I would have found a material. Literature, Christian literature. And I'll say, why don't you read this before he comes? And that thing is a knocking thing. I'll say, you will, you will enjoy this one. And then she will, you know, because of the way I said it, and because also I was a senior to even, uh, you know, his boyfriend, he will not be able to reject it, so he'll be opening it over and over. And then I will sit tight there uh, doing my work. And then when they wait and they discuss, uh, you know, for one hour, one and a half hours, and they say some things aloud that, aloud that would have made me to, you know, pack my books and, uh, you know, go to the library or go somewhere, I just sit down there, I change subject, I change position, I sit tight there. And after about, uh, you know, about three hours and three and a half hours, that lady will be so sad because of this person that will never cooperate. I never cooperate with sin. I never cooperate with sin. Why should you cooperate with sin? Why should you give them chance and liberty to do evil? I sit down tight there. In fact, if, it's, if it is time for food in the evening, if she was still staying there, I will not go for food. I will sit there. I've always been a troublemaker, you know. And then as I sat down there, eventually at about 6.30, 7 o'clock, uh, she will say, uh, I want to be going now. And then I will greet her. She will barely answer me uh, because she, wa she wasn't happy. And you can tell the following morning, if I called my roommate for, you know, the, the morning devotion, no, not, no morning devotion. Uh, but, you know, for those three years I was there, we were roommates together. We were there in that same room together. And except it was all the day that I was not there, you couldn't practice evil in that room. You couldn't do it. If you came in with, you know, other people will come and be joking with him. If they said anything against the Bible, even if I was preparing for exam, uh, you cannot dishonor my Lord and I will continue with exam. You cannot do it. I'll rise up and say, in this room, room B3, Azikiwe Hall, you don't do this in this place, University of Ibadan. And immediately I took my stand like that. You know, they had to backpedal and they have to say, oh, we're sorry, pastor. I didn't ever know I would become a pastor. They started calling me pastor before I became a pastor. But you know, it is good to take your stand for the Lord. You will not sin when you become a child of God and you will not permit other people. You will not give them license to sin. You know, some students will even give, give the key of their room and say, go and use my room. Never. How can you do that if you're a child of God? Other people will help iron clothes the clothes that those people are going to wear how can you do that other people will give transportation and uh, money to go to their dancing party to go to this and that never never when I was a student I knew that you ought to glorify God the way you are living and in verse 22 of First Timothy chapter 5 First Timothy chapter 5 verse 22 it says lay hands suddenly on no man neither be partaker of other men's sins Keep thyself pure. You see, as a child of God, one, you want to live a righteous life yourself. Because if anyone is in Christ Jesus, is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Not only that, you do not condone the sins of others. 
encourage the sins of others. You do not connive with them to continue to do evil. You will not be a partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And it was, you know, it's been like that with me by the grace of God since those school days. And I've, uh, I've been everywhere. And um, by the grace of God, I'm invited to speak here, invited to speak over there. Some of them I'm not able to honor because I'm busy, but others I'm able to honor. And those ones I honor, uh, for example, I have a letter waiting now and expecting me uh, in uh, Britain uh, next year at a particular time. And the, the fellow wrote there, he said, we, we want you to come and talk on church growth. And then they put it as church growth and holiness. And then he wrote as a footnote, he said, I have heard that uh, you talk, you like to talk much on holiness, and we do not want to disrupt the way you like to minister. So please come and talk to us on church growth and holiness. Let them know you are something good. Let them know you that you stand on the word of God, that others may play with the word of God, that this is where you stand. So then point number one, salvation and righteous living. Number two, sanctification and inward purity. What do we call sanctification? If somebody had already been saved, what does he need again that you call a different experience, a subsequent experience, an experience that will do a greater, deeper work that had been, than had been done already? This is called sanctification. Sanctification. And what is it? Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 29 for an illustration. Second Chronicles chapter 29 for an illustration. In verse 5. And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Now, as a casual reader of the Bible, you may not understand the significance of the verse I've read to you now. Let's refresh our memory. With the worship style and the worship location of the children of Israel, they had um, a tabernacle. And that tabernacle of worship was divided into three parts. You had the outer court, you had the holy place, then you had the holy of holies. It was at the outer court, they had the brazen altar. At the brazen altar, they will offer the false sacrifice to atone for their sins, which is to us a symbol, a picture of salvation. And then at the holy place, that was the place they will offer the showbread. And that to us signifies the second experience. But then there was another place, the holy of holies. And the most inward place. And that signifies to us the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And then it says over here, sanctify now yourselves. Then it said, sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. And when he said sanctify that house, then he amplifies, he explains it at the latter part of that verse. He said carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Now do you know that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we are now the temple of God. And our heart is now that holy place. And you need to carry forth the filthiness, the filthiness of the Spirit. The one that has been in the heart. It's a sanctification that the power of God himself and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus will carry forth, will take away, will cleanse up, will purge the filthiness out of your innermost being. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore... These promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If it were not possible, why will the inspired writer put it in the Bible? 
If it were not possible, why will you say, let us do it as if with urgency, with earnestness, with faith, and with clarity, this is what we have to do. This is our duty. It says, let us cleanse ourselves. Then it says, from filthiness. And then it says, from all filthiness. When I read the Bible, I do not overlook any, any word. You know why? Because Jesus said, not a jot or title will pass without being fulfilled. When it says a jot or title, he was using in Greek language something like the dot of an eye, the crossing of the T. So in the vernacular, it will mean that all the word of God are so important that not the dot of an eye or the crossing of a T will pass without being fulfilled. I said that to say this, to say this that it says, let us cleanse ourselves from all, all, all filthiness. If it were not possible, why will you say it? And I say, as long as there remains a little jot of filthiness, a little blot of filthiness, a little stain of filthiness of the flesh or of the spirit, then you have not arrived. You have not arrived. You look at your own heart, you look at your own thought, you look at your own motive, you look at your imagination, or look at what you call daydreaming, and look at the things that pass within your heart, and the things that you brood over, the things that, the things that you think over. If there is any form of filthiness there, it may not come out in a bad language, it may not come out in a vulgar language, it may not come out in any action of immorality, it may not come out in anything that anybody can say you have committed sin, if it is deep down there, in your soul, in your mind, in your brain, in your intention. You have not done it, it's there in, your, in the intention. If it's there in the imagination, in the motive, in the very heart, then all filthiness has not gone. And you do not want to stop short until everything is fulfilled. When it says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. And of the spirit. In my earlier days, before we started a deeper life, 1771, I used to move around a lot with the scripture union. And this time we were having uh, the scripture union meeting in Enugu. And uh, I was uh, handling the Bible study uh, series of fourth epistle of John. And we had prepared that Bible study from chapter 1 to chapter 5. And I was to be doing the review. And we, we started uh, that review uh, the first night because we'll generally do that review when all the others and the younger ones from form 1 to form 3 uh, at that time when they had gone to bed. And then those of us or those of the students from form 4 and 5 that were to actually do the teaching with those that were non-students then were doing the review at night. And then uh, as we were taking the review and we came to chapter 3. That whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Because the seed of God remains abides in him, he cannot sin. God favored us with the uh, outpouring of the spirit of soberness, sobriety, and seriousness. And that night, we went into that word and went into that word. We forgot that we were preparing to reveal, just to teach the following day. And you know that there was uh, one of the sisters there. She heard that word. It broke her down. Oh yes, she had been saved. And I'm talking about real salvation in the scripture union in those days when we were involved. All this jewelry and palming and lipstick, all those things were not there. I mean, we really went into the word of God. And that night, that woman, you know, just stayed there and prayed and prayed and prayed and forgot that if she didn't have enough sleep, she would not be awake enough you know, the following day to lead the Bible study. And she prayed and prayed and prayed until, you know, the Lord revealed to her how the Lord whitened her heart, purified everything. She loved God so much. Even beyond the things we were discussing at that Bible study, the Lord sanctified her. And after the Lord sanctified her, by the time we got up the following morning and she was giving testimony to us, you know, she'll be giving testimony. Tears will run down her eyes and say, Holiness. 
holiness she couldn't say any other thing and when i don't know whether we even allowed her to teach because emotionally and because of all the things that had happened to her she couldn't compose herself to you know begin because if she started reading a particular verse when she came across the grace of god that appears unto all men teaching us that we deny ungodliness and worldly laws when he came across anything like that she might break down just weeping and say holiness holiness she wanted to drink all the holiness you could have from heaven the lord did something for her soul it was in that meeting there was another woman after we are taught on sanctification like that and uh, we we also gathered the people together after the junior ones had gone to sleep we had in the night what we call digging deep and in that digging deep is where we go into into the real meal because it says the meal belongs to the people that are skilled in the world but the people we knew that were wanting to press on to higher ground we call them together we are digging deep and uh, you know we finish that digging deep i think about 1 a.m in the night and then uh, when we finished and you know, we rounded up with prayer and we went back to go and sleep there was this woman again very serious with the lord the lord sanctified her not only that we didn't you know in the scripture union that time we were not allowed to you know talk about everything about being baptized in the holy ghost about speaking in tongues and all that but she stayed there and you know five o'clock in the morning 5 a.m the power came from on high and she started speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues, spiritual union. And then when we all came in the, at the morning time for just our morning prayer before the real program began, uh, the, the, the brightness and the glory on the face of this woman, we knew that she had touched heaven. And I pray that every one of you, every one of you will touch heaven. And you know, at the time she was giving a testimony, you could tell, you could tell, you could tell the fire of God within her soul. You could tell the whiteness of her spirit. You could tell the holiness and the purity. You could tell the power of God. You see, when she finished her testimony, not a dry eye remained in that congregation. You know, we were not used in the scripture, you know, to weeping and crying, but oh, we cried, we cried. We cried because of the glory of God that came down. We cried because of the purity from the throne of God that came down. And you know, it was a blessed, wonderful moment that we never forgot. In fact, I saw some of those people with the scripture union uh, about 10 years later, and you know, they will tell me, they will, uh, they will call my name and say, do you remember Enugu? Do you remember Wilcox Memorial in Abba? Do you remember that uh, scripture union you know, at, uh, um, uh, at uh, the other place, uh, I think, Okigwe? And do you remember that other one? Do you remember that other one in Port Harcourt in Oron? We just went everywhere and everywhere we went. The power of God and the holiness of God was just flowing. I want those days back. When God himself will show, will open heaven to us, and you, everyone, he will give you this holiness beyond your dream, beyond your desire. If you will just say, oh Lord, give it to me, he will give it to you. And uh, you know, the, the Lord just brought in my understanding. As I just said, oh Lord, I know nothing, and all that I want in life is just to serve you in holiness and righteousness. All the days of my life, if he did it for me, he will do it for you. You know, I still remember. I was a student then. I'd gotten saved in 1964, April 5. And then I went to the University of Ibadan. And, uh, you know, in, these, uh, in those sessions that I used to, you know, just lock up myself and just read my Bible, seeking the face of God, I'd gotten saved uh, before I entered the university. But then as I was there, just reading the Bible, reading the Bible, it was on the 17th of November, 1965. And about 6.30 in the evening, that I just closed the door and locked the door, I said, Lord, today is today. It wasn't a meeting like this. It wasn't a congress like this. It wasn't a church service. I just locked the door. I read the word of God that said, if there is only one person in the whole world that will want to get sanctified and remain holy, even, all, even though all people around him are not holy and not righteous, and they don't want it, if God can find one person on the face of the earth that will seek God and be holy, I said, God, I am that one. God, I am that one. Whoever wants it, whoever does not want it, God, I am that one. And I just locked the door. The, the, the others were at the cafeteria. They were eating. But I said, oh God, I don't want food. If you don't sanctify me and make me holy, where will I be? And what will education do me? And I just, I was by my side, the side of my bed, kneeling down and praying. 
tears coming out. Nobody prayed to me. I was just reading that thing. And you know, before a long time, that time, that very evening, 17th of November, I will never, never, for how can you forget? When you meet God face to face, how can you forget? When it brings a fire from the altar of heaven, how can you forget? When it circumcises your heart, when it purges your heart, when it takes that Adamic nature away from you, how can you forget? When the fire continues to burn, and you know, when I came out of that room that very day when I was sanctified, I don't know whether I could talk to anybody. In fact, I still remember the name of a particular brother now, a beloved brother, but not in deeper life. Because, you know, 1965, there was no deeper life. 66, no deeper life. He belonged to a particular place. He saw me like this. He said, my brother, the way I look at your face, you are going too far. I couldn't tell him what was happening. But he knew because he had been a Christian before I became a Christian. And he said, the way I look at you, you are going too far. Because, you know, I was, I had been at the altar with God. And I said, I lay this thing upon the altar. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Many years, think about it. 1965 to this time, many years have come and gone. But I thank God that consecration I made in that room, B3, Azikiway Hall, it is still standing today. And I'm still keeping on it today. And that is why I still invite a lot of people that you young people make a covenant with the Lord. That the Lord will sanctify you. That the Lord will purify you. And when he does, there will be such a work in your life that you will continue. And if Jesus tarries, uh, you know, many years, then we'll still find you in the kingdom of God. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? Oh yes, you can do it. Point number three, supplication and holiness experience. If God is going to do it, you will need to pray. If God is going to do it, you will need to call upon the name of the Lord. If God is going to do it, the prayer you pray is not just the regular prayer. It's not the ordinary prayer. It's not the prayer that somebody is pushing you. It's not the prayer that you are opening your eyes and looking at the time. It's not the kind of prayer you are praying. You say, well, when are we going to stop? It's a kind of prayer you are totally abandoned unto the Lord. In Osea chapter 10 verse 12. Osea chapter 10 verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness. So to yourselves in righteousness reap in mercy. And break up your fallow ground. You see that? Break up your fallow ground. If you see that all these things do not move you, oh, you say, then my heart needs to be broken. If you see that all these things do not plant a strong desire within you to move on with the Lord, then you say, my heart will need to be broken. So to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. And then it says, For it is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. How long are we supposed to seek the Lord? Until He comes and rains righteousness upon us. Not a trickle, not a drop, not just a little part of righteousness, a flood of righteousness. Until He comes and rains righteousness upon you. When you are sanctified like that after you are prayed, you pray in faith. You consecrate yourself to the Lord. You hold on to the horns of the altar. You say like Jacob, I will not let you go except you bless me. You come like Isaiah, woe is unto me. And I'm undone because I, I'm of unclean leaves and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. For my eyes have seen the king, the king of glory. Then flew an angel unto him. And then with the coal of fire from the altar of God, he touched his leaves. And then your sin, he said, your sin is put. Your sin is taken away. Your iniquity is taken away. You pray until a real work of sanctification has been done. Now, what is the evidence of sanctification? That is number four. Well, there, there are a lot of things we can talk about as the evidence of sanctification. But one, there will be purity in your heart. Your motives become pure. Your imagination becomes pure. Your thoughts become pure. Your life within and without becomes pure. You become so sensitive to anything that is out of the way that you will not want it in your life. Holiness surrounds you. Holiness saturates you. Holiness envelops you. Holiness runs in the veins of your blood system. Holiness is in your mind, is in your brain, is in your thought. Holiness is what you are looking for, what you are desiring. Holiness is what so saturates you. It's like you are injected with the injection of heaven. And that holiness line is always within. And anything that deviates from holiness, oh, you will hate it. You will not want it. 
it may be appearing to be little, any shade of sin, any shadow of iniquity. You don't want it in your life because there is that purity of heart. Not only that, there is love. You love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And you will do anything. You will go anywhere. You will confront anyone if God wants you to do it. Because it is a kind of love that loves God supremely. And you love your neighbors as yourself. There will be meekness in you when you are really sanctified. Do you know about Jesus Christ? They accused him, but he will not answer. They told lies against him, but he will not answer. The meekness of the Lord, the gentleness of the Lord will be upon you. And also you will be teachable. Because you know, the stony heart has been taken away. A heart of flesh has been given unto you. And so, all that will be within you. And then, there will be humility. You know, you will be so humble that people can step on you. And people can take your right from you. And you will never rebel. You will never petition anything, anyone for anything. Because of that mark of heart circumcision. Heart purity in your life. There will be unity with the brethren. You see, when you become really sanctified, the people of God who believe the whole Bible, you'll be united with them. You will not have a disagreeing spirit. There will be no pride in you. The pride that will look down on other people, the pride that will belittle other people, you have real unity with the people of God. And of course, holiness. Holiness will be your lifestyle. Holiness will be what you do in the day and what you do in the night. And even in the night when other people are not there, holiness will be your watch word. Now, if this is what you want, the Lord himself has told us to sort yourself in righteousness and break up your fallow ground. You know, if there, if there ever came a time in my life when I did not want more holiness, more love, more unity and more of heaven's fire to be dropped on my soul i'll have to break my fellow heart all over again it will mean that my heart has become insensitive to the call of heaven and if there ever comes in your any time in your own life when you can hear about holiness and righteousness and our purity and the circumcision of earth and then there's nothing in you that wants to cry out and say oh god make me another enoch today I want that holiness. I want that purity. I want it to be upon the altar of my heart. I think it will be time to break up your fallow ground. In fact, the Lord says, it is now time. It is now time. It is now time to seek the Lord. And how long are we going to seek the Lord? Are you hungry? Or are you not, are you not willing to pray? It is time to seek the Lord until He comes and He rains righteousness upon you. Until He comes and He rains righteousness upon you. Until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. Until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. Until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you.
today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just came up for all this provision. I just blessed you with the 